No, I never, I never had trouble to come back. Never had and come back. We do have minutes. I always come to something. Get a Steve on board to help us play. Yeah. Anything I can do for you, you know that. Have you been? I'm good. I'll work on that for you. I have time to do it. Yeah. I got to talk to you. I'm here in this. Yeah. I'm so tired. It is a good game. I'm here in this. I understand. How you doing? Yeah, I'm here in this. I think Jose was telling me. Hello, Ed. It's been much longer. It's been much longer. It's been much longer. Yeah, it's from the front. Yeah. I don't want him. Yeah. Yeah. Steve, Steve is from Brooklyn. The front row is moving up after you. And that's even worse. That's even worse, right? Isn't that worse? We never shot this guy. You guys have any problems with moving after you being right up to the front of the agenda? Is that not an issue? Can I move him up to the front of the agenda? Yeah. Dr. Yuvin? Oh, that's fine. So that's fine? Yeah. Yeah. Jose, did he give you a budget? Or is it, is it <coughs> there's, there's, there's a write up on seven? Yeah, number seven. seven. <coughs> Good evening. I want to call the uh, Finance uh, Committee of the Whole uh, to order. We uh, have a uh, quorum. And I uh, want to thank everybody for being here tonight. Uh, let me start off with uh, need to entertain, a, entertain a motion on the April 7th minutes. I get a motion to approve the April 7th minutes. So moved. It's been moved. Seconded. Second. We got a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Minutes stand approved. All right. So this is our second round. Um, we've gotten. The material in the mail with regard to the questions that have been uh, 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 posed and then the answers from the administrative staff. You should have gotten a package tonight, right? Everybody's got their package? Two, two should be two packages. They keep growing and growing and growing. So, so again, thank you to the staff for uh, responding. Uh, thank you, Deborah, for compiling all that information. And, uh, so tonight we're going to be uh, going through um, sections. Any questions left over from section four, five, and then we're going to five and six. And uh, we're, not doing five. we're not doing five. No, because we just got section five last Thursday. Okay. So we'll do five next at our next round, mm -hmm. and then we finish up with uh, East High uh, section seven. So. And eight. And eight. Can I ask when are we going to get this capital improvement plan? Um, in the next round, we're doing section five and section nine. Okay. Oh, okay. Right, our commitment was by Monday. We'll have CIP by Monday? Yes. Okay. You want to meet the last bit? All right. With um, uh, permission from our committee, um, we're going to be moving the agenda around a little bit. Dr. Eubing, we're going to have you. Uh, Take first place on the batter's role there and uh, give us a presentation on East High. And then, if there's any questions, I know that you have a class to go to as soon afterwards. If there are any questions we don't get to with regard to, to East High, uh, we will have those uh, in, to you and, and through Deborah and uh, uh, any requests for additional information. So, Dr. Yuri, please. Thank you, Commissioner Cruz. Uh, good evening, everybody. Nice to see you all. Um, actually, I was talking to the president uh, a few days ago, and he asked me to do a little bit of an update. So if I may take up no more than two or three minutes of your time and call this East by the Numbers, uh, what have we been doing? Uh, we actually, remember this, we don't become the EPO until uh, July 1. We've been working extensively with the gentleman on my right and the gentleman on my left, and, and the, the, the two great uh, women at the end of the table. Uh, in supporting our plan as we move it forward. We've had outstanding cooperation. Uh, this is a new uh, approach, and so there's a lot of discovery as we go through this. Everybody, everybody is doing it for the first time. There are no procedures, no manuals. 
Um, but we've been very busy uh, engaging our future staff. We've um, had 90 applications for administrative positions. We've done 40 interviews. Uh, we, are, we will bring you recommendations, uh, we think, first week in June for the entire administrative and teaching staff. We had 447 individual applications for teaching positions, including, I believe, 146 from East, and uh, the rest from mostly um, other city uh, applicants and many uh, from charter schools and a handful from outside the district. We've conducted over 600 reference checks. Uh, we've, uh, uh, we have 14 different subject area committees working all kinds of hours interviewing each of these candidates. Not every candidate gets interviewed. You don't do a good job filling out the application. You're not certified. You don't get interviewed. But we've, we've uh, probably done close to 400 different interviews. Um, uh, we have over 30 faculty uh, who are working uh, at some point uh, on this process of engaging the staff, identifying the staff. In terms of students, um, we have 56 students who have signed up to be in grade six, and we anticipate that number is going to get up to about 80. Uh, we do know there's a school closing, and, and we have arranged, uh, uh, we will arrange to talk to those children and invite them to consider coming to sixth grade at East. Um, so we will have a sixth grade, and every single child who's in sixth grade at East will have chosen to be there. Nobody's going to be told you must go here. You don't have a choice. It's all parent choice that, that their kids will go to East and be part of our, our program, which would be a very literacy-rich um, extended day program. Um, now, I was told by Annabelle that last year of the incoming seventh graders, not a single one had actually chosen East first. Um, but I'm told by Barbara that this year there were 71 students who chose us first. Uh, another 70 that chose us in some other rank. And right now we have 115 committed to um, attending uh, East, uh, either choosing us in the first, second, or third. Uh, we haven't been assigned any. We'll be up to 160 when we're done. We're going to start reaching out to these students, inviting them into the school. We're a little bit cart before the horse because we can't invite them into school to meet the faculty because we haven't determined the faculty yet. So we, but, but everything's happening all at once. Um, Gary Valente, uh, who's sitting right here, is uh, overseeing the uh, hiring of all of our support staff. We have uh, 33 people who applied from RAP, 77 from Bente. Um, there's 8.8 .8 food service positions. There's more than 8.8 .8 people, but they're, they're not full-time full positions. We've engaged the School of Medicine, the School of Nursing, Eastman, school, uh, the Optics School, uh, all in terms of helping us to create this original school. Um, and there are scores of other people from the University of Rochester who are also involved. Uh, I'll say a couple quick things about budget. As you will recall, we put our budget proposal together actually in October. And to some extent, we're working blind in that um, this is a, a new animal. We've never done it before. We know some areas we're going to be fine. Um, we have to, I think, uh, clarify as we did when we submitted the original budget, that the things that the district's always paid for, we anticipate to continue to pay for. They're not part of our budget. You know, as an example, we didn't budget for a school resource officer. You have um, um, subs that you budget for. You have building subs you budget for. You have certain special education positions that come from the district. You have some arrangements with Hillside. There's eight Hillside workers in the building now that, that they're not in our budget, per se. Um, and things of that nature that you've done that we hope you'll continue to do, that we anticipate you'll continue to do uh, as we get into uh, the rest of the year. Athletics is another example. That's a district-wide thing that we didn't budget for. It's, it's, we anticipate it's going to be continued as a trainer. Referees and nurses, I guess, come from BOCES. We've learned a lot. Um, Gary and I, uh, I couldn't have done any of this. We couldn't have done any of this without Gary's support. Um, but we are ready to launch. We put out a professional development calendar for the summer. Um, all of our staff will participate in at least 11 and sometimes up to 16 professional development days during the summer. Uh, we'll actually start our professional development in spring. Uh, once we um, announce our staff, we invite them. We're sure there'll be some people who are unhappy uh, because they want to be there or they won't be, and, and we recognize that. We've had very, very good people apply, and not everybody can be engaged and be part of the new faculty. 
Um, we're sure we're going to have some administrators who are disappointed, and we understand that, but not everybody can be part of that process as well. We're also working through a number of issues involved in programs as we roll this out, um, but we want to have a, uh, a major positive uh, professional development day on May 1st. The district's been kind enough to let uh, the EPO uh, run the uh, PD day, which is May 1st it, at East. Um, uh, I invite all of you to come at 8 o'clock in the morning on May 1st. We will give you U of R bagels. Um, I always think, say that's about the only free thing I ever get from U of R is occasional bagel, so I would grab one. Um, uh, President White has, uh, uh, and President Seligman, all the presidents are going to be there. They're going to address the faculty, and, uh, and Sean and I will say a few words. And then they'll be involved in PD all day. We have uh, PD around restorative practice, which is... Um, the direction we want to go in terms of ha helping kids to feel differently and think differently about their, their school life. Um, one of my theories is not my theory, only one of the theories out there is if school is a, and this isn't going to happen on day one, but if school is a happier, more productive, friendlier place, kids are more likely to want to go there. You know, if, if it's a place where they've always failed and they continue to fail and they continue to feel that they can't, the, the sense of hopelessness. And a lot of that has to do, I think, with you know, the mandates that come down from the federal and state government. And, uh, you know, uh, we are, we have to follow those the same as everybody else. But we have some great agreements with RTA and others that we hope will allow us to move forward. So that's my quick update on East and my sense of, of the concerns we have, may have with making sure the budget links together. You know, it's kind of like a, a two rocket ships in space now. We have the one we created in October, and Bill's been great about trying to make sure that when we finally launch this, there's no gaps uh, that were not covered. First day of school, we don't have a school resource officer or something like that. So I'm, I'm happy to answer any of your questions. So, uh, Steve, what is the um, demographic breakdown of your teaching staff? How many of those African American? How many are Hispanic? So forth and so on. So, um, Commissioner Elliott, we haven't determined the teaching staff yet. We're still in the middle of uh, sorting through the applications. I can tell you, we, say, we face the same problem that the rest of the city faces in that it, it, we, we don't get the full uh, diverse um, applicant pool that we'd like to get. Um, I've, I personally have not done interviews, uh, but I've been assured, for example, that we've gone to um, uh, great lanes to increase the diversity of our staff, especially looking for male teachers who um, are reflective and look like uh, more of the kids. But let me say, for the, the fact is, there's not as many of those candidates out there as we wish there were. Um, and so that's going to be a continuing challenge. Well, I, I tend to think that um, we have to be more aggressive in identifying those candidates. I tend to think that they are. Um, and I think that we have to um, look at how we can attract them uh, to this uh, to this district. But uh, continuing on this same uh, point, then how many of those teachers have urban experience, or 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 the staff? How many the um, vast actually have the experience to do this kind of work? Again, we haven't setting? identified all the staff. We're going, we're doing that now. But I can tell you from the process we've been involved in, I would say that. Almost all of our teachers will have urban experience. Um, and, and it's kind of interesting. You know, we have a premium that the board uh, approved to, to work at East. You would think that we would have attracted a lot of the area suburban teachers who might want to um, be part of this. But the vast majority of our applicants are either city East teachers, city teachers who are not at East, or charter school teachers. And then we have some who are out of state. And by the way, they tend to be a more diverse group. Uh, some who are uh, a handful coming from the suburbs, they tend to be a more diverse group, um, and, uh, but not many. Most of our applicants, but we have some really, really outstanding people who want to be part of the East story, and we're really, really excited about it. Thank you. Any other questions? Here. Um, I had I had a specific question about it looked like it looks like there's a decrease in the number of science teachers and I wanted you to comment on that and also speak to your vision for the optics program the information technology 
program, or if, I'm not sure if, I'm, if that's the exact terminology, but you know what I'm speaking of. Right. Um, and to, to the other unique, strong programs that we've, um, you know, throughout the process have said that, you know, we want to maintain a commitment to culinary, so, um, TLI, and so All forth. of our programs, all of our CTE programs, uh, we are committed to grow. Um, CTI, uh, CLI, rather, there's a lot of acronyms. Um, the culinary program, the optics program, um, all those programs are committed to grow. We are re-engaging all the teachers who are in those programs now to continue. I, I was, uh, I was uh, um, honored to be one of the guest, guest sushi chefs at the uh, Iron Chef competition. Um, so was my colleague, Dr. Susan Meyer. Uh, her student won the competition. My student did not. But uh, I don't think it, it may have something to do with it. I dropped that potato when I was uh, feeling it, but it, I'm not sure of that. Um, uh, the, uh, we're going to have a very, very exciting science program uh, because the focus in middle school is going to be on pre-physics. And, and we have a, in our program, every student, if you read the EPO plan, when they finish eighth grade, is going to have a unit in science. And it's going to be in general physics and be ready to enter um, uh, the biology course right into ninth grade. Uh, we'll have a, the, the, it looks like the number of science teachers are down, but, but it's really not compared to the fact that we can do six periods, we can do more with our teachers for longer periods of time. Uh, classes aren't going up, and we're not reducing any offerings in science. Um, going back over your question, Mary, I don't want to miss anything. Well, just the, the programs, but I think you covered it. You, you affirmed that you have a vision for growth. Do you see any new, um, like medicine related? Sure. Uh, we, we are committed to developing a CTE program in medically related careers. There's two programs we're working on. Neither one will be fully developed in September, okay? Because CTE programs, as you know, take more time. They, they, and you know, the district's doing some really cool stuff at Edison. Uh, but we're committed to developing a CTE program based around uh, medical careers and technology. Everything from you know, working as a nursing assistant all the way up to being an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, and we have already started uh, discussions. We have this other part of the University of Rochester across the street, strong. And we've already started discussions with how we can build on a relationship that's already there. Um, and, and they've been really open to, to being part of that. So we want to be able to say to kids this year, at the end of ninth grade, um, one of your options for CTE is this medical related careers program. But there's a lot of work to do that to get it certified by the state. And we're having early discussions with, uh, on an avionics program um, mm -hmm. all around the issues of, uh, of uh, and, and you know, the vision is it'd be housed at the airport, you know, junior, senior year. We have a partner that we've started discussions with. And the other thing we've done, uh, and we'll bring do this with this program once it takes, forgive the pun, once it takes off. But, um, We'll, bring, we'll invite the city, if they're interested, to be part of it. And so there's several programs that we've talked about already. You know, we have a program called Big Picture, which is an off-site program for kids who've failed everything in ninth grade. And, it's, and um, we've worked with the city and saying they're going to be our partners in actually developing this program, you know, for another high school and then maybe another high school after that. We're also doing a program around the, for all of our sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth graders called Leader and Me which is based on the, uh, the uh, Franklin uh, uh, Temple uh, Stephen Covey teachings as a basis for what they do in those small family groups. And you know, we're gonna, we've opened up the city to, to, to partner with us and bring another school in and receive the training simultaneously, <coughs> as long with, along with several other things. Because we, we see this not as a competition, but a partnership. On the topic of CTE, and something I haven't heard anyone talk about at this point, you know, there's a radio tower, a very visible radio tower on, put on Main Street. And yes. I don't know if we still have any radio equipment, but I have not heard anyone talk about revitalizing some kind of radio technology um, track among the CTE programs. I know someone who was a high school dropout who became a, a Learjet repair person by way of getting a job at a radio station and learning how to work with the radio components uh, at the station. So 
I can see. And that's, I mean, that, that's just something within my, my own very limited experience, but I can see how exposure to a radio, a student-run radio station and that sort of thing could translate into uh, a, not only a CTE program, but a potential <coughs> recovery track for people who are bored with school, not incompetent, just bored and unwilling. So I've actually asked about the radio tower. <laughs> and um, I'm sure people at this table know the answer. That apparently it's part of the city's emergency response program, you know, in case there was a disaster or something. Um, and so it's integral, it's still being used, it's still active, I guess, but not as a radio tower per se for broadcast. Yeah, it's, it's used for our, our, our fleet, you know, vehicle communications as well. Okay. And uh, it's actually uh, in need of, you know, replacing over the next couple of years. So we're exploring, you know, different issues around that. So, so the, um, but, but the answer to your question, and it's a great idea, okay, and, and that's why I'm glad you, you have doing such great work at Edison. The answer to your question is, what is the capacity of one high school to offer a CTE? Because if we, let's say nobody drops out ever, okay, now you have 180 kids coming into, uh, there are 360 kids potential 11th and 12th grade. And what, what number of those kids are, are going to benefit from a CTE program? Out of the 180, let's say half of them will. Okay, let's just say, that's, that's a lot, but let's say half. Now you have 90 kids. How many programs can they support, those 90 kids? And is it, there's not an infinite number. It's a, you know, so um, that's why the medical uh, uh, careers uh, uh, options was an op natural for us with our connections. And uh, the early explorations on avionics was, uh, was actually brought to us. You know, we're just kind of responding to it. But it's interesting because of that great resource we have, which is Monroe County Airport. And, and there's so many careers in, in that field. But we have only had initial discussions there. But, um, you know, the, the other thing you can start sometimes is to build a radio club. <clears throat> and sometimes a club will, will attract more interest and then you end up getting make, making a career out of it. So that's a great suggestion. I'll tell you one of the things I want to do and something I know the Bohan wants to do uh, and we're working on this, uh, I worked on it today, is I want to provide driver education for our kids. You know, for the kids who are 11 go 12, on, you get, they got to be on track to graduate, okay? And it's almost zero cost. You know, you, you charge $25 and then when you finish the program you get $25 back you don't finish the program, you don't get your money back. It just encourages you to show up. And we're hopeful, but, but not committed and positive, starting it this summer. Um, but there's a lot to do to start a drive ed program. We have to get approval from the state. We, we're trying to get a car donated. And you have to identify a teacher that's a shortage of teachers. So, uh, but yeah, every suburban school district around here has driver ed. All of my kids have taken driver ed. And why wouldn't our kids at East have the opportunity, eventually all of our kids in the city, you know, um, to take driver ed. It's not a luxury. It's part of growing up. And, and by the way, the rest of us on the road will benefit <laughs> if they take driver ed, you know, theoretically at least, you know. Ms. Superton, I have a question uh, for you. Uh, and this is an old question, but it still concerns me. But as I look at it, and we're talking about East tonight, but this is for all the schools. Um, that we will pay our school centuries an average salary of $27,000 and our teaching assistants $27,000 and then but we pay secretaries $60,000 uh, $55,000 and maintenance mechanics $55,000 and it, it always go to the point that uh, these salaries are it, it's almost racist in my opinion because most of those pe most of the people who are school centuries or teaching assistants are African-American females or African-American men versus those secretaries who are predominantly white women. And it just seems to me that these, te these school centuries and these teaching assistants are on the front lines and we got to do something about increasing those salaries. Secretaries are not on the front lines. And they're not doing the kind of physical work and the kind of getting there uh, and in many instances putting their <coughs> bodies on the line with respect to school centuries. So we've got to look at increasing those salaries. 
this, this is just, I think it's racist, and I'm just going to put it out there. Um, uh, I'm glad to hear about the driver's ed, but I think some folks in this building may need driver's ed. I was pulling into the parking lot today, there's some folks parked over the lines. I wanted to call out the cars. But um, can you uh, just comment about, obviously, you know, we're spending a lot of money on East High School. I'm always questioned about the um, expenditure that we are allocating for East High School. After year one, so in June 2016, after we go through the first school year, what are some of the milestones that you believe um, will justify the expense that we're having? What, what will success look like after year one where you will, where you will be able to say to the board, all right, I'm glad we did this, or man, what the heck were we thinking getting into this, um, <laughs> this, uh, this school district? So um, I asked myself that. What the heck were we thinking? <laughs> um, the, um, we, we are setting up our tracking system now, and uh, the, 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 the indicators that we'll be most interested in um, going into the first year is literacy development six, seven, eight, nine, especially six, seven, eight. Um, we'll have the sixth and seventh graders will be first time with us. Uh, they'll have a more intense uh, literacy development program, vocabulary acquisition. We'll track very closely uh, ninth grade completion. Now, we, we anticipate that the sixth and seventh graders, when they become eighth and ninth graders, will have a higher level of on-track graduation in ninth grade than the kids who are currently in ninth grade. This is not a criticism of what's been offered, but we're going to offer a, uh, extensive support for reading and, and, and math that the district's not offering right now. That's where most of your money's going for it, extended day, more time with kids, reading teachers. Um, so we're, those are going to be, in terms of the initiatives we're bringing forth, uh, those are going to be the most critical uh, uh, benchmarks and attendance. You know, attendance, there's two theories on attendance. I know that you got to go out and, and, and convince the kids they have to come to school, and I think there's some, some uh, basis to that. I also think you got to make the school a place where kids are more likely to want to go on their own. You know, if you think about our kids, coming into mm -hmm. seventh grade last year, 78% of those kids were reading at level one, which would suggest they could not be expected to perform at grade level. And so that means they come into an environment which they are projected to not be successful. If we can help them to be successful, they're more likely to want to come back and, and give them the supports they need. So we're using you know, the, the best research-based programs to move kids along in terms of literacy development and math, and I think that you'll see that, um, that that's where you're going to see the gains in year one, two, and three. We're not giving up on any kid. Um, I think attendance in programs like Big Picture, we are in negotiations with a community agency around a freedom school concept. Uh, I think those kids, you'll see improved attendance, and with improved attendance, you'll see improved academic performance. Any given day, we're at 78% attendance at East High School. Um, that, and it's not the same 22% who miss all the time. Mm -hmm. So we have to move attendance up eventually, long term, so it's hitting 90% or better every day. And I think Boham <coughs> wants to do the exact same thing in the rest of the district. So those are the benchmarks that we're going to look at most closely. And so if I can see the beginning of improvement in a year. I don't expect to see a right. turnaround in a year. Right. If I see the beginning of improvement in those key benchmarks in a year, I'll feel that we're on the right track. Because I think that watching 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, especially 6th and 7th grade, as they move through the system, that's going to be a key indicator of whether or not these things are successful. Thank you. Um, um, and again, let me apologize for being late. I, I, you know, I convened the Unite Rochester elected and appointed leaders group, and we had a reception over at the um, Democrat and Chronicle, they were nice enough to let me speak for five minutes on top of the agenda and then leave so I can make it here. Um, my my um, second question is, um, and, and this may be, um, well, I think it's important to get it on the record because this is, this is a different model. How, how do you, um, how will you ensure um, that there is good coordination between central office and um, the East High, um, 
EPO, because notice it's different. East High is kind of like a separate entity, but the district is responsible for a lot of the um, administrative, um, well, the, the, you know, the buses and, and things like that. I mean, it's like, like East is going to have its own separate bus fleet. Finance stuff is going to be is going to be you know run through the district. So how how, how do you how do you how do you what will you need in order for to make sure that that works? You know, uh, a question I got I get sometimes is oh it's going to be crazy. You know, is the district going to cooperate with them? How are you going to make sure you have you're still going to have a current superintendent and then you're the, the EPO kind of serves as a superintendent? So how can we assure um, the community and how can you let us know um, as a board what you will need? Um, and what you would look for in terms of making sure that there is this symbiotic relationship, because this is this is new new territory and ground, and um, I, I know uh, some I know a little bit about egos. Not saying anybody here would have any, but how do we, you know, make sure that this is going to work? Uh, being that it's in this uh, well, in, in this context, the main thing is Bohan and I both met stance. Okay, so we got the baseball thing down. And we're doing well this year. And how the Mets doing? I don't know. I don't know how the Mets are doing this year. Yeah, they won eight in a row. <laughs> but on a serious note, uh, we work at it, and you know, we, uh, we. I mean, Bohan and I go out to lunch about once every three weeks together. You know, we take turns buying. We we talk about the problems that we're seeing. We how can we cooperate? Bill sent me an email today. Can you help me get going on something at East right now? And I've turned it over to East Principal. How can I get this going? Uh, I mean, Adele and I have met several times on program. We have had, a, I believe, a very open relationship. We're not going to agree on everything. I can guarantee there's going to be times where we disagree. But so far, everything's about finding a resolution to problems, not about, you know, we're allowed to disagree and move forward. And so I can say I can't be more positive about the willingness of your central office to cooperate and help find resolutions to issues as they come up. It, it's entirely possible there's a, in, in the um, EPO agreement, there's a arbitration mechanism. Right, right. Use. It's entirely possible at some point we're going to say, gee, we just can't find a resolution to this. We'll have to go back to the board and let you resolve it, okay? But right. uh, thus far, we haven't even gotten close to where we couldn't resolve anything that, you know, um, that I can think of. I, I don't know. I, can, I don't want to speak for you guys. So. No, I, I totally agree that the model that we have here is unique never been done in New York State where the Board of Education, the superintendent, central office, and the university have come together and I say, we're all in. And I think that our record speaks for itself. But, and there are competing interests. We did move some resources in the FMP to East, but that's because we, we view East as part of our school. So the South, South children, and the last thing that I want to say, we want to learn from East. When we recommended this, it was to learn it. It's not just, we're not doing this just to benefit 1,400 students, although that would be noble and wonderful. But what can the system learn from it? And in order for us to learn, we're going to have to collaborate. And I think that I could tell you that up to now, it's been a model for collaboration, um, one which I think is worth emulating in the part of everyone. Thank you. That's good to hear. And then my very last question, Mr. Chairman, is um, I think uh, you have another unique opportunity in that um, a lot of the students that are at the U of R may not be too old, not, not much older than the students that are at East High School. How will you utilize, I, I really hope um, that you will utilize um, th those students at, at, those students at the U of R, particularly the, the minority students that are at the University of Rochester, so that way uh, students at East High School can know that college is possible and that they can aspire to be where those students are. It, it, I can't remember from the EPO agreement because I read it so long ago. Is there a mechanism in there where you really want to try to engage students that are existing at the U of R and connect them, uh, maybe as mentors or tutors, with uh, students that are, that, that are at East High School? So I, I, that's a really common question that I have to field. And um, uh, let, me, let me just um, uh, answer with an analogy. <clears throat> um, right now, think about you're at this concert and there's these people saying, stay away from the stage. And then at some point, you can come up. Um, the biggest thing we have to do right now is make sure on day one, the place is running effectively and efficiently. That every, the schedules work, the teachers are there, the books are there, the computers are there. That, you know, and so we've had hundreds 
and that's not, that's not an exaggeration. Hundreds of people say, well, how can I help? And what I say to people is, you can help. After we get it going around November, we're going to then really look at our partners in the university, specifically the undergraduate students who aren't much older than our students, the School of Medicine, Eastman, and all of our partners to say, now we want to start to build these partnerships. Because the worst <coughs> thing would be if we opened school and everybody was tripping over each other trying mm -hmm. to figure out how they're going to help. Um, we're really, I've really been stern, if you will, about uh, with all my friends and colleagues and volunteers say thank you so much. We want your help, but in the first couple of months of school, we got to get this running and running effectively. One of the things I'm going to ask the state to do is do a diagnostic tool visit early, and so to give us a gauge of where we are and how we can improve in that model and move forward. But I think the long view is I expect there'll be a time when hundreds, hundreds of U of R undergraduates are involved in mentoring <coughs> and tutoring and, and visiting uh, East High School, where there is a regular bus run, because U of R has its own buses, as you know, uh, from the U of R over to East almost every day, and kids have strong relationships. One of the coolest things that we're able to do, and it's a budget issue, and you funded it, is build these small family groups where every student's going to be part of a group of eight to 10 kids that's going to meet every single day with a faculty member. Well, that, that's a, a sense of attachment, you see. It's a sense of belonging. And when that student's not in school, he's missed. And he gets a text message. And, and people start to say, you know, where's so-and-so? Why isn't he here? And the, and the advisor makes the phone call. Now we bring in a second level of, of U of R students being around, being part of those groups, and having individual relationships with the kids in terms of their academics and the rest of their lives. And the kids from East coming over the U of R and RIT and, uh, and all the schools getting a sense of what college is like. Uh, we want them to have hope. <clears throat> we believe that through enhanced academic programming at the middle school, that they can have a reason uh, for more hope. And, and more than anything else, I think that's going to build attendance. The, 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 the idea of knocking on the door is a great idea, and we'll do that. But more than anything else, kids have to want to get up in the morning and go to school. And, and that's a good place to be. That's where I want to be. Not just because my friends are there, because I see a connection between there and the rest of my life. So all of that, I, I, um, by, you'll see develop kind of crescendo, you know, as the year goes on. But for the first month or so, we just want to run the place so it works. And then, then make sure all the parts are moving along solidly and then build uh, uh, with our partnerships. All right. Make sure the basics work and then expand out. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're good. I, I talked to Mr. Neal, the last question is Thank you very much. Sir. So I actually have a class that somebody's covering for me right now, so I have to uh, bug off. But thank you, gentlemen, ladies, and uh, appreciate all your support, and look forward to continuing to work together. And again, if we have any questions or concerns, we absolutely email them through you, uh, through uh, Deborah to get to you. Thank you. We are uh, reviewing any uh, sections. Any questions on section four? We'll go down the line. Now, uh, the staff has been phenomenal in terms of, uh, of questions being generated, the responses that are being generated, and just answering a lot of questions ahead of time. So. Um, it's good to see that we're getting the kind of response, and we're getting them um, um, fairly ra rapidly. So, uh, again, want to thank the staff for doing that. That makes our job that much easier in terms of trying to, you know, pull questions out at last minute. But uh, it, 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 at least staff is really taking the time to review the questions and giving us some pretty uh, uh, intelligent answers to them. So, if we want to go right down the line, uh, Commissioner Evans, do you have any? Yeah, comments? just just the process question, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, we always say that this is a draft budget, um, and, and I know sometimes the uh, staff gets nervous when we, when we say it's a draft budget and then we start making changes to it, um, but it is a draft budget. Um, what's the, what's uh, the process for um, uh, making recommendations for uh, amending a section or um, have we established that yet, or is that just something that 
we should do at the, at the last one, or should we put it in writing first um, as a proposal to the board, or maybe to you as, as, as chairman, uh, you know, something that we're thinking about. I mean, I don't have tons of amendments, but there are things that um, I would like, I would like, like look, looked at. Um, the other thing is, is that if we do make uh, an amendment, would the expectation be that we, that, the, that it would be recommended that we find a offset for where the, the, the funds would come from, or would we leave that to the administration to say, here's what we would do in order to make that, um, to make that happen? So this is more of a process type, yeah. type question. Um, well, I, th I think it would seem to me that we would want to go through the process of getting all our questions answered, getting more specific details in terms of what our concerns are. My, my concern is the timing, and I'm looking at Bill as I'm saying this, because obviously uh, they've got deadlines to work with, too. So um, what I would suggest is if you have, if you have a, a suggestion in terms of some budgetary changes, you probably want to get them to me as quickly as possible um, as we're going through the process, even though we're getting more details. Uh, and then I think I could work with Deborah to get them over to Bill and, and sort of take a look at those. And then, obviously, <coughs> you know, we still have May 7th, I believe, is, you know, the date of adopting the budget mm -hmm. in its totality. So we can work towards getting those changes in there and see what impact it has. Um, the, the problem with adding to the budget is that we're adding to, we've got to find the, the revenues to be able to address whatever we're adding. Right, right. So, I mean, it, I want to, you know, to be responsible about this, I think, as we're looking to add something, you may want to give some consideration to where you want to take some, suggest where, where it's going to come from. Um, and um, that's always the hard question, isn't it? Right. But, yeah, you know, and I think the responsible way to do that, because if not, we can just continue to add several million dollars in this budget. Uh, ultimately, it's going to fall on their shoulders to figure out what you're going to cut, because the money, the money is really finite to begin right. with. So, uh, so be cognizant and sensitive about that as we as we go through, and, and um, if you're going to add something, that you really take a, a think about it. So, again, uh, if if there are some things that you really are passionate about that you want to see. Uh, get those to me. Uh, we'll start working them in through the, in the numbers, working the numbers in through through Deborah and Bill, uh, and then we'll look at the impact, and then ultimately we have to decide how we're going to accept, uh, you know, what am amendments we're going to accept at, um, as we adopt the budget. Okay. Um, um, and we're 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 questioning section um, four. We're we're in section four right now. Okay. Um, and, and this is an overall question. I'm not sure if this was asked during the. Um, during the, uh, in the written questions that were there, and I'm still waiting through those. But just a general question, if a school is uh, subject to being phased out, are those, uh, we're recognizing that anticipated revenue from that school closure or phase out in this budget, in, in this current budget? And also, how, how are we arriving at those numbers? Are we looking at historical numbers? I'm, I'm a little concerned about how we, how we arrive at the savings on, a, um, on phasing out a school. So two-part question. Okay, I thought the first part was a revenue question, then the second part is an expense question. Yep, there you go. So on the revenue question, is part of the... Um, the governor's budget, he did allocate, you know, $75 million across the state for those schools that are effectively in receivership status. And, um, you know, and, and so we've been modeling, uh, and we did not include any of that, you know, in the budget. Um, we've been modeling um, what we think um, could be a range, a minimum range for East High, given that um, we've already have approval from SED for that, you know, for, for our, our budget, and, and so we've been modeling that. Um, if you model it uh, on preliminary numbers on a, on a student basis, that could be about, um, <clears throat> well, I, I've got a cold now, so I don't want to say, but I'll, I'll give you that number. And, and, and so outside of that, 
We haven't modeled any other um, uh, increase. We are going through a planning process for those other schools, and then and then we would go, we would go, uh, we would go from there. The uh, then the schools that um, you know that the board has approved, you know, to close. You know, we have obviously taken action on on um, on that, um, and and you know specifically. Um, you know, with 36, that's that's embedded in the budget, right? And then, um, and then with, with 44, um, you know, you know the, um, you know, beginning to, you know, to um, to shrink that footprint, um, you know, and to allow those students to, um, you know, to, um, you know, and families to plan accordingly. So, so you're saying that the closing number that of, of a save of the savings is based upon the the number of students. No, so so the savings, um, like for example, the. Um, let me see if I can find it here. For example, the savings of co closing school 36, right. right? You know that was driven by, you know, the staff associated with those those students that you know that were that were at that school. Those students are going, you know, to other schools, you know, within our footprint, right? Mm -hmm. And 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 will um, and will you know be taught by you know teachers where we had underutilized classrooms. And it also allows you a, a savings on the administrative staff at School 36. And the amount for School 36 closures detailed out in the executive summary. Okay. And then there's, and then there's, uh, and, then, and then there's other building savings associated with that? Correct. Like for the heat, light, and power. So the board took action. And I apologize because I got a really bad cold, so I'm struggling just to to get everything together here, no, that's all right. um, but but two sessions ago the board approved, you know, the final piece for 36 and um, 22, because the city wanted clarity as far as you know when those buildings would come back to them. So we did not, you know, budget any utility cost associated with those facilities, and you know we notified the city that they needed to plan on receiving those, and um, and there's been correspondence to that effect. Um, with the uh, with the understanding that we'd have the month of July to um, you know to um, to remove the items of value that could be used elsewhere in the district, so in that case there was a specific utility savings as well. All right, thank you. <coughs> Which one? No, 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 I have no question. That's section four. Um, so we're back at, yeah again. We're section four. So anything related to section four. Uh, just a, a general question, um, and I'll, I'll um, direct this to the superintendent. In our conversation this morning with uh, over at School 28, there were some um, some issues that that she needed to have addressed in order to continue an improvement um, uh, academically over at, at 28 School. So the the question becomes. Have we consulted with our uh, buildings to ensure that, as much as we possibly can, given budgetary constraints, that they have the resources that they need in order to continue improving upon um, their um, uh, their academic goals? Yep, we have, and I'm glad that you mentioned the discussion this morning. One example. Of as you recall this morning, she mentioned her challenge with the uh, so many part-time staff, and I use that word part-time because like Commissioner Cruz told us, be careful with using education, I don't know how you call education, language of, but the reality is that the, our KA principal came to us and told us that they had too many people <coughs> on part-time work, 0 0.9, 0 0.8, and we are addressing that in this budget, and that came as a result of us engaging the principal. 
and they have been engaged at different levels. Now, there are times when principal asks for more resources or programmatic change, like you heard a little bit about the special education, some of the changes that we are proposing that they were somewhat concerned. But I'm going to ask, uh, Bill will tell you that we had an extensive engagement and also uh, Dr. Otua uh, will tell you that the chief and other have been engaged in the, uh, the principal and listening to their concerns. So, so this, is, this, this is a budget where, for generally speaking, the buildings support. I will say so. You, you we had always, you never have 100% consensus, right. but uh, sometimes they, they are not even aware that we have responded. And one example was the itinerary that she mentioned as a concern for the K-8 building. Remember she said, we had too many part-time people here that they show up at 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock and, and that that doesn't give them the stability that they need. So that's been addressed in this That area. has been addressed for the K-8 building. Yeah, a couple of examples, I mean, so the process question, you know, so we had a, um, you know, at least two, two deliberate separate sessions. We had a focus group with a, a small group, including the, um, the ACR president, where, where we spent two hours getting ideas. Um, and then uh, um, two deputy superintendents invited us to, uh, to a uh, to a principals meeting where we also then you know receive their input and, and and gather that as part of that you know just what the superintendent said you know the voice we heard was you know try to reduce the itinerant teachers in our jargon you know part time for a, a parent and and um, there was also this notion of, of online credit recovery that they wanted support in the schools so that's that's an investment in this budget as well you know that that came out of this process. And there was also this notion that we could be more efficient with our use of substitutes, and they put forward some ideas and some practices that have been going on in some buildings, at least, that we should consider. So those are a couple of things. Um, and then the communication continues, and then I would let Dr. Atua <coughs> articulate the communication that continues. You know, obviously, you do have fiscal constraints. Right. So we, we did go through an, another round, um, you know, just, I don't know, was it a week or 10 days ago? where we made some further refinement based upon their feedback. So, so let me just also ask this question too, if I could to you. Has there, have you found there's been any negative uh, feedback as a result of the investment that we're making in East High School? Has there been any, has there been any criticism from other schools that we're making this kind of investment? Generally, uh, you we hear uh, what does it mean to the rest of the system? Mm -hmm. And I think the board in this budget, we responded that to the best of our ability, we also responded to the needs of all the schools. But they have been that general concern. But to give you an example, they notice that their sport program or their art or their music or their reading is now being adversely impacted. So. I think that people were waiting to see what we, you know, what kind of impact with this, the moving some resources to East, what kind of impact we have in the rest of the system. And I think that the budget that we're proposing to you um, addressed that concern well. Yeah, the one, one key factor there was, and the superintendent could be modest about it, but his his effort in going to Albany and, and working with our partners on both sides of the aisle in, in you know, getting a significant increase in state aid this year was you know, a significant part of where we are you know, in this budget process. How much did we get from the state? We received a 6% increase in state aid, which was you know, the, the draft budget assumed is 7%, right? So we're $4 million less in the foundation aid, right? And the, um, however, you know, as part of how we would, could close that $4 million remaining gap. And I'm sorry, Lily, but it, my, my code's lifted a little bit now, if you remember the number. Oh. <laughs> so, um, so when you model you know, the, the number preliminarily on just on a per student basis, for East it could be about 3.3 million. That doesn't mean that we wouldn't try to advocate for more, but you know, if you take the four, you adjust for that 3.3 out of that 75 million, you know, then, then you know, we're, we're within striking distance of, of having you know, 
a financial package that that is consistent with the draft budget that we've outlined, you know, for the board. So, how much in, in dollars does that six percent increase um, equate? It was a twenty-one point nine increase in foundation aid, which was. Mr. Chairman, I just want to clarify something. I, I did, of course, ask written questions uh, on Section 4 um, regarding attendance rate and graduation rates, and, and those many of those questions were answered. But I did have a process question. When I looked at one of the written responses, uh, and I think it's called Questions Round 2.1, uh, it's, it's it doesn't have a page number, but it says Board Questions <laughs> 1.47. I asked a question about why doesn't the budget book contain information for the following schools, All City High, Northeast College Prep, Northwest College Prep. There was a, an answer for All City High, but then with respect to Northeast College Prep and Northwest College Prep, Bill, I think your answer was uh, this information will, it's page four actually, will be included in the proposed budget. Yeah, we, we so, submitted so, it though. So, so the process question is this, this was the process question. Is, are we getting revised? portions in our budget books? Should I be looking, for, in other words, section four? Will I get another section four that has that or just the pages? How does that work? We, we provided two pages to, to Deb. Um, in your, in your 2.1, round okay. 2.1 packet, um, oh, I didn't three hole punch it, but there is, it's uh, 1.47. Oh, I see it, okay. And then Northeast and Northwest. All right. I just want to understand the process. Thank so you very much. So it's in much. there. I can also Thank you, Bill. put it in your Thanks, phone. Everton. No, no, no. I got it. Thank you. Thanks, Everton. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I'm good. All right. Any other questions uh, coming down the line, Mary? Uh, just one quick question on um, Section 4. Are there reading teachers budgeted within the UPK budget? Yes, there will be reading teachers budgeted through the UPK grant, but we're looking right now, we've budgeted one. We're looking to shift some positions around so we can have more than one reading teachers in that grant. Reading teachers in pre-K? Yes. Not literacy support or, because my kids don't, never read in pre-K. We feel that early lit literacy starts at a very younger age than kindergarten. So if we can help teachers support, if we can support te if we can support students and provide them direct support for those whom we know do not know the alphabets or letters, I think we can do well better. I, th I think, uh, Commissioner Adams, I think what you're getting at is extremely important, and that is the literacy support. Um, reading is capture that like Dr. Otua saying kid knowing the letters of the alphabet and that sort of thing is extremely important um, that you don't overdo it that you also know it's about playing and yes it's about drinking the milk and resting and that sort of thing but it's important to know and you always use the language of, of expert and child development we, we, it's about language development I mean um, even uh, book talk, talking about books could have an influence that you can introduce the kid to the shape of a book. And right, so right, yeah, I mean they do a great job in pre-K as it is right now yeah. without um, specialized literacy or reading teachers, but so what exactly is that based on in terms of um, findings? Well, no, no, I mean like unique to our local program? Were there some findings this year or last year that, that pointed to a rationale to add literacy specialists into pre-K classrooms? Yes, we look, we look at our began um, report uh, assessment that mm -hmm. students in kindergarten took at the beginning of the school year uh, that shows school readiness, and we're using that report to uh, guide in our decision making to support some students who may need that support. But how did that, how is that linked to what's going on or not going on in our existing pre-K programs? Um, I would tell you I visited pre-K class. And no, I would, I'm not asking for, any, I'm sorry, oh. I'll do apology. I'm not asking for anecdotal evidence. I'm asking for, you know, we say we're data informed. What, what's, the, what's the data? What's the, you know, the recap finding or um, 
you know, we have, we have actually a great database mm -hmm. in the pre-K world, which is unique, <coughs> uniquely strong. Mm -hmm. So what in that has led to this? It's the it's, it's students' readiness in kindergarten that have read, led us to this. So though our pre-Ks are making significant gains, but when you look at the data, there, there are some students that are struggling that we think that that early literacy at that age will be very beneficial for them in order to help them to be successful at school. Because if students are not reading by third grade, their chances of dropping out is very high. So we want to provide that extra support even before they get to kindergarten so that they are achieving better on our, uh, on our um, assessment test, on our readiness test. Okay, well I would just argue that I would expect much more precision in terms of the mechanistic, the, you know, the mechanism and the actual, what's going on in pre-K not just um, an absence of readiness or pointing to, you know, that this, there's been a lot of description and a lot of analysis of that data that talks about maybe what happens in the summer and so forth, but I would like to see a, the next level of intensity and, and thought and research base in terms of what the rationale for putting literacy, um, so you can't just look at kindergarten readiness, you have to look at what's going on in the existing program if you're intervening in the existing program. So I don't, I don't, we don't have to keep going back and forth here, but that's, that's really what I'm looking for. So I will provide you that analysis because I do have that analysis and also when you talk about the summer school, we are having our pre-K come back, I think it's about four weeks early because of that summer uh, learning loss. Right, so, so that's, catch that's yeah. exactly, like there's a rationale, there's a, there's a mechanism that's been identified and then there's an intervention that's based very specifically on what you suppose is a reasonable guess as to what might be happening. So that makes a lot of sense. I will provide but you adding more. reading teachers to pre-K, I, I would like to be convinced. I will provide you uh, an analysis that we did to support uh, our decisions and what we are thinking about following up with. I'm glad you raised that question, Mary, because I want to I want to be more specific about how it feels to see reading teachers at pre-K. But uh, my first question is, what do the suburbs do? They have reading teachers. I'm guessing they don't use them in pre-K. What? And for us to go out in the world and advertise that we're putting in reading teachers for the first time in many years after completely eliminating reading teachers from our budget, but we're deploying them in pre-K, it strikes me that it, that it is a gross misuse of their talent, that, that we're only a, achieving a fraction of what we can expect them to achieve by deploying them in pre-K instead of when they're actually in the midst, in the very heart of the process of learning to read. That, excuse me if that seems too strong, but that's exactly how I feel. I feel like that's a bait and switch and that, that it's deceiving the public and maybe even a deliberate deception of us. And maybe it's simply because we don't know what to do with reading teachers, but we want to tell the world that we have them. So are we saying kids shouldn't be uh, learning how to read in pre-K? They should be supported by their Any pre-K kids. Pre -K kids. Yeah. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't understand. I mean, I don't understand the argument. I mean, I, my son's in, in a, in a pre-K program, and I want him, uh, I mean, he may not be able to read, but I mean, I was taught how to read before I got to school. So I, I, don't, I don't understand the argument about, <laughs> uh, I mean, I just don't get what the problem will be for introducing reading to pre-kindergarten. Yeah. They should be, 95% of a child's brain is developed by the time they're three years old. In fact, I think kids should be learning how to read when they're two and three. And then particularly coming from, and if you're coming from an African-American home, you better know how to read even earlier because you got to be that much better in order to be um, ahead. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not, now if they're being misused, that's a different conversation, but, I, but I don't, I'm not understanding if the conversation is whether or not kids should be introduced to reading in, in, in pre-K, I'm not sure what the, so I can better understand, what the, can right, so clarify just, what the concern is? Well, well I'll, I'll get back to my core concern, which, uh, which I think tripped your trigger, is we have a pre-K program that's been evaluated and shown to be over years and years and years as effective as any program there is. And now, and now we're offering a change without any justification. 
So you're saying you feel the program is changing from where Excellent. it is now. Where is the justice? Adding reading teachers is a, a profound change to the program with profound financial consequences. Why? And that, let what, me address, what data is driving? Let's it. allow this. The May I address your financial concern, Commissioner Power? I think it's a valid question. When you have resources, you want to know where you want it, where you can get the best return on investment. The reality is that the, the pre K finance or literacy expert is come from uh, a grant. So the grants allow us, and for many reasons, why we should put someone who understands language development in the context of reading. And, um, you know, I, I hear your point, but to answer your financial concern, this is earmark for the purpose of strengthening our, our uh, pre-K program. And yes, I look at the data, as you know, you and I both were on the board when we started this pre-K program. So I looked at the data for years. And while it is true that it's a highly effective program and everybody in this community should be proud for providing that high quality program to our students, it had its own shortcoming. And what part of the, the someone mentioned the summer learning loss, but also they were what when you look at the pre-K, what they did, they allow us to gain, the student gain a lot skill set, but even when I think Commissioner Evans is references to, when you compare them to middle class children that I now, you know, as Commissioner Evans mentioned, that I getting high, high level of language development at a very early age, the district, at least our theorists say that we had to do more and more to even keep in pace with, with the demands of today's world. Yeah, I, I would uh, agree with uh, Superintendent and with uh, uh, Commissioner uh, Evans. I think because, particularly with African American students, because they come in so far behind already that it's necessary, and the, the number of words that African American students know when they enter versus what white students know, there's just a huge gap. And I think that if we're going to increase graduation rates, uh, have them career and college ready, it is important that, you know, and, and, and I know that uh, there is a push on early childhood education. So to have resources, if we can financially uh, provide the resources around literacy and around reading, I think that that is going to help us to increase and position our students to, um, um, to succeed in primary and secondary education. So I think it's, it's really necessary for us to do that, at, at, even at, that, at, at the universal pre-K level. Mr. Chairman, um, for what it's worth, I, 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 many people not, may not realize this, but my undergraduate degree was in teaching. And, um, but the best effort for me as a teacher when I was a parent of very young kids, and I, and I got to agree with Commissioner Evans on this, mm -hmm. uh, I think my kids were ready for school because I was and my wife was their first best teacher, and we were reading to them as soon as they came out of the womb. Of course. Right? So I, I but, but that's not happening in a lot of right. families. It's not happening. And so where the school system can support that, I think they should be there to do that. I think the reason why our kids are behind the eight ball when they get to ninth grade uh, is because they weren't prepared early on. And so the school system, I think, is there to provide the support, specific supports, instructional guidance that maybe some parents cannot give. So I, I, I think it's a wise investment. I do. Uh, you know, and I think, I think it will reap benefits years down the road. And one of the things that we complained about a couple few years ago, the board said, before you even got here, Paul, and I think it was before you got here, or when you were just got here, we were like, why are we reading in the paper that Brighton is hiring reading instructors? I read the classified ad for Brighton hiring reading instructors, and Bill Collin was saying to us, yeah, we got reading instructors in Fairport. Why weren't we doing that? So I, I'm not sure, uh, maybe, maybe I, I'm not uh, paying attention to the argument, but this is what we've been waiting for. This is what our kids need. So. But it's okay to have an argument and debate. I, I don't. I, I, I just, can I just clear? Can I say something? Because I don't want to be 
Like, uh, Malik, your kids are not in UPK yet, right? No. Cameron's not. So, I mean, having a first grader and a third grader, I'm very close to having kids gone through pre-K. It's heavily, heavily literacy enriched. And oh, trust me, the Adamses read to their kids. You know, I mean, and, and so, so but, but it's he, not but he, but he, right, and I hear what you're saying. Just to clarify, he, he, he was, he was because we, the district doesn't have a two-year-old pre-K, which I wish we right. had. I had to pay to put him in a Montessori private two-year-old okay. pre-K program. But, but I'm talking about where, direct experience with the district's UPK program but, but what I'm saying and is how that he's literacy getting, rich it is but what I'm saying, already. But what I'm saying is that he is... I, I, I will feel confident by the time he comes into the district and is in kindergarten and first grade in the district that he'll be able to read. Right, but then again, we're, we're talking about somebody that right, who's, that we'll who's, had all those, who's had all those supports, mm -hmm. which is great. And I think, you know, we all, we all want the best for our kids, our neighbor's kids, our relatives. You know, we encourage them to read. We give the books away. We model reading. But I'm, so the point is not trying to back away in any way, shape, or form from early literacy or reading or the value of books and loving books and reading and language enrichment and going through playing the games when you go through the grocery store where you name the items. I mean, these are literary, liter, literacy enrichment activities that are developmentally appropriate and meaningful that our programs do phenomenally. And what they, um, the reason why I know that there's like the grocery games that like I might play anyway with my kids because I just jabber at my kids because that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to talk to your kids and support their language that way. But there's parent educators, adult educators, teaching other parents to do those kinds of games. But if we're making a trade-off where we're not disseminating that kind of support for our parents who might not have been as well supported as we've been privileged to be, if that is a trade-off where we're lacking some of the parent education piece or sharing those kinds of literacy games that are developmentally appropriate, then that could be a real problem, and we could actually be undermining. That's, but, but that's the that, only point is, I make. Is that a trade-off? Not in yeah. any way. Want, it is I in want, this budget. Uh, if, if I may, please. Um, I think there's a series of questions there and some concerns. I would strongly recommend that we put those in writing. I think we have, you know, I mean, if it's a, if it's an issue that is, it seems like there's a lot of atten a lot of interest in this, that it might be something for one of our committees to go to go through because. If, uh, I guess one of the questions is, 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 is this a really the same kind of literacy teacher that you normally would have in a, in a regular classroom? Is there a separate kind of modality that they're using for a three or four, for a four or five year old? So I, these are questions that we can put to you folks, um, and then we, you, can, you can pursue them because we're not going to resolve this issue tonight. So I want to bring us back uh, and get us back into uh, section four again, if I may. Uh, but if, again, if you have questions, please uh, direct them over to Deborah, and we'll get them to the administration for uh, necessarily not for just this budget situation, but for uh, future concerns. Okay, thank you. Anybody else on section four before we move on? Um, okay, we'll, we'll worry about that. Yeah, uh, yeah uh, just one other question. You know, uh, you didn't have any before. What happened? No, 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 no. You said any <laughs> other questions? This is a other question. On section uh, four. On section four. Okay. Uh, and it's actually a very important question. Um, thank you, Mr. Lopez, for forwarding to me. Uh, I think it's called Roster Report, more than 109,000 students, right? The pipeline has been redefined. This is about schools, Section 4. The pipeline, if, for those of you who don't know it, for those of you watching, has been totally redefined. This administration, this school board, has been focused on that pipeline, understanding what's in there. The rules of the game change dramatically now. And if you look at that list in that report, and Mr. Lopez probably can send it to whoever hasn't gotten it, because this is significant, folks. We need to study this report because it has totally changed the game. This idea of receivership is defined by this list of schools. There's a very specific list of schools, the time from there on. Uh, these folks, these schools are on parole, if you will. These folks are on, uh, uh, now listen, you say you don't like that language, but that is what the state is doing. And we cannot look at Section 4 the way we looked at it three months ago. Absolutely not. It's a totally different game. And so the question that I would put doesn't have to be answered now, and we talked about it a little bit this morning, what is the pipe, you know, if you look at this report, you know what's in the pipeline now. And, and again, I would encourage you all, they, if you look at this report, it talks about Charlotte High School. It says how much money we, we've gotten per student. 
It says how many years, it's this house, I'm fine. It says years failing. This comes from the governor's office, by the way. The number of, the number of students that are enrolled. Um, and there are schools, Charlotte, East, Monroe, 45, and number nine, have been, quote unquote, these are my words, that's the state words, the governor's words, failing for 10 years. As you all know, that puts them on a different track and a different pipeline. They're now talking about receivership. And, and, and let's be students of this. Uh, as, as I basically understand the law right now, it's not only the receiver that takes control, but the superintendent in the preparation for it leading to the receiver takes full control of the schools, can turn them into charter schools. We, need to, we really need to understand what this law means and what it means for our schools. So the, the question, the abbreviated question so we can move on is, what I would like to see, and we talked about this morning, is how, what is the plan now for these schools, including, by the way, number 44 is in that governor's report. I mean, they are calling us out directly and telling us what is going to happen. So really, quite genuinely, section four is, is, is gotta be, there's gotta be a whole different discussion because our district could look dramatically different next year. Uh, so. My question is, Mr. Chairman, it would be helpful to have a written something in writing with respect to what we're going to do with these about, it was about 14, 15 schools, which last year when we were doing the pipeline report, it was, what, two, three schools? And we took care of those schools. Charlotte, East High School, uh, we, didn't, we didn't resolve Monroe, but we pretty much had our attention focused on those schools, and we even did leadership meetings at those schools, number nine. But the game, the situation is very different, ladies and gentlemen. And one thing I did not know, thank you, Mr. Lopez, is that it's not just the receiver. In preparation for the receiver taking over, I don't know if you guys knew this, the superintendent is empowered to do a whole slew of things. I, I, I'll be the first to admit, I didn't know that. I don't know how many of you knew that. So we got to know, since you would theoretically have that power, what are you going to do? in the next year with these schools, because that's the budget. The budget has to reflect what's going to happen next year financially. And now the state law is saying this superintendent will have a whole slew of powers and a whole slew of options, which if he exercises any one of them, including he can discharge employees, <coughs> he can turn it into a charter school. Yeah. With all uh, those powers, we cannot look at Section 4 the same way. So what I would ask is a written description hmm. of every school that is listed in the governor's book and how you intend on dealing with it logistically and financially. We have what, five or six? Oh, oh there's more than I that. Would, oh, I would tell list. you that I, I've been thinking. Oh, yeah. yeah. But between schools that are 10 years on the list, seven years on the list, five years but on the list. I mean, in terms list. of next year, that have to be, isn't it five or six, or is it? Well, it's, uh, it's, it's 10 years. I think there's oh. four, one, two, three, four, five. Let me see are on the 10-year list, which means they will be subject to next year. Deborah has Deborah did some research on that. She might have some, some uh, additional information. Well, but, but, but the, the, the Deborah did some research for us in the pipeline, right? No, this is since then. It was what I sent out a summary yep. um, of the changes in New York State education law right around, it was right around April 1st when the New York State education budget was adopted. And it, and there are two basic distinctions. One is failing schools, which are schools who have been, that have been on the priority list for um, three consecutive years, and then persistently failing, which are schools that have been on, in priority status for 10 years. 10 years, right. The failing schools, for those, um, the the district has two, two years, years. Yeah, I get it. To, to continue operating the school. At the end of two years, then NYSED comes in and does an, a performance assessment, basically. And they make a determination about whether to keep the school in failing status, remove it from failing designation, or basically then to designate the superintendent as the receiver. At that point, actually, uh, and, I, I and know. I just want to just one quick second. Um, then, for the persistently failing schools that have been priority schools for ten years, um, 
the district has one year to turn the school around to show significant improvement. And I said, does the assessment after one year? Um, and in those situations, then um, if they determine to put the school in receivership, then an independent receiver is chosen. That's, so, that's a distinction. I think it's best that they were pressing the one white is suggesting for us to put you something in writing, which uh, I think we don't want to enter into clarification, but it, including clarifying this two years thing. Because I think what President White is saying, you ought to understand that the, the school board will not have the kind of power or authority. And I'm, I'm going to form, I sat in your seat, so I understand your interest and concern. But the law is the law, and you, no one in here can make, you know, we could change the law through advocacy and everything else, but I think President White is correct. This has, uh, you had to look at Section 4, totally different than how we view that in the past. And we do have right now four schools that we did act, we got in front of it, uh, but um, you ought to understand we have only one year. Now this is not even close to Massachusetts law. I would tell you that what's common to New York State for district like Rochester is like Massachusetts. Central office, we had to change it drastically. Um, uh, I will tell you it's common. Um, it's sort of like I told you, college-less schools are something necessary for this community. And I think we, we, you did the right thing as a board, by the way, and you need to be commended for that. But that was taking risk. But this is no time for the status quo. And uh, I think I've been trying to talk to our bargaining unit that we no longer can continue to view Section 4, President White. I will say it's not just the border education that need to view Section 4 differently. I think all our bargaining units need to see it differently. Our families, our friends, our advocates, Rochester is not in a position to look at this thing just with the same lens as before. Let me just add, and congratulations to the board. I know that you had challenges. Some of you have concern with expanded learning. But if you look at what we have been doing and what the statute called for, the change in the law is called, for example, community school that has that kind of component, like a school 17, which, by the way, is in that list. Uh, is calling for uh, expanded uh, learning uh, approach, engaging family in a different way. So I think, uh, uh, Commissioner Cruz, uh, we will be writing a report. The only thing I could say to you tonight, the, the, I echo the sentiment of President White. It's not just the Board of Education that need to look at this thing differently. I, me or another person would be in a position to exercise that kind of power. Now, I would tell you I would exercise it judiciously like anybody else, but you cannot longer continue to view Section 4 like you used before, uh, like we were planning to do. And we were doing well. And I think the board was doing a, a terrific job in looking at Section 4 with different lenses, but you need to shift that right now. going to ask, can you just refresh my memory? I know a few of the schools in the receivership. What are the ones that are? Uh, the one for next year and one year is Monroe. Right. The school of nine, mm -hmm. East High School, Charlotte, and possible 45. There's a question about it. Those schools have one year. Mm -hmm. Now, the good news, as President White was saying, is that we got in front of some of it, or mm -hmm. then. Right. And then, you have eight other schools that are in the two-year list. And those are school three, school eight, school 17, school 22, school 34, school 41, school 44, and school 46. 45, I'm sorry, 46, oh, my apologies. 
<laughs> Close, but the big difference, 45. So I think we'll uh, to summarize this portion, uh, you're, you're, you're going to uh, respond in writing to give us a sense of where we are with this. And if you can list out what schools and what years that we're looking at so that yeah. give us a better we, understanding. We will give you that. And I, again, I urge you to look at this like President White said, for urge our bargaining unit and every member <coughs> of this community to look at this school differently. Because what I mean is that if we don't make the mark in one or two years, you're looking at a drastic change in coming our way. It would seem to me that, uh, uh, President White, that this might be such an important issue that we might want to have a work session okay. specifically just around this issue okay. uh, to get presentation because the implications of what you're talking about and also to not only just uh, the kids in the schools, but all of our units there and the kinds of things that potentially could happen. I think we need to get a better hand, a handle on what potentially this could mean. So that's something you uh, we might want to think about organizing. It might be helpful to do. I'm, I'm forwarding, thanks to Ed Lopez, um, I'm forwarding you all a copy of that report. It, right. it should be required reading. Thank you. Yep, yep I will. I will. You, you all should get um, it right you, now. Are you all set? Well, my que so my question was actually about Monroe, a follow-up. I still don't understand when I look at, like I had talked about before, I, I get what we're doing and all of that. I still don't understand with an increase in students, with we're still decreasing by seven positions as well as close to a half a million dollars with 40 more students. I understand that there's projected... That's from section 4.130, um, based on projected enrollment. So I'm just trying to wrap my head around what's going to be different and um, whether they are set up for success in this year. Because when you've got 40 more students and half a million dollars less, minus seven positions, I just don't see that adding up. No, that's a great question, but there have been significant change in, in what, and from year to year, Bill and Edmonton can talk about this when we shift uh, uh, the resources, but one of the planning for next year to answer your question was going to be different. We are going to start school in August, mm -hmm. and that is by having requested by the school community. And uh, we will be presenting you with a plan. There also will be additional dollars for Monroe, part of the $75 million that was put aside for those schools. Uh, they will have a non -competitive access to non-competitive grant. But to answer your question right now, the radical difference for next year, one thing is beginning the school early. We, we are finding that too many of our students go away to the Caribbean, you know, Dominican Republic or Puerto Rico during the winter. So the school community there is working hard to find way to, uh, you know, offer half a year courses and that sort of thing. But we will be able to give you a thorough plan. Um, at first, the half a million dollars, could you answer that, Evan? No. They have so what, that was consistent, but the reduction in staff was special ed was a big portion of that where they shifted the classroom configuration. So while the number of students remained the same, the configuration for the special ed classes changed. So we did look into that, and I believe there's an answer that was provided by uh, Dr. Tour and uh, Barb Goldhammer in reference to that. So she's just trying to find the, the, the allocation for that. And your question is essential. We met with, with uh, the princip principal Ramos, and she's working with her staff. Actually, we are going to rely heavily um, on the work that she's doing there. You will see some growth and some improvement in the graduation rate. Actually, you're going to be, I don't like to promise I'm going to deliver, but the number that, I look, that I'm looking at is the very they're very good, and I do know that President White like to congratulate people, but they had a, one of the best testing environments 
that I saw in uh, high school this year for our uh, middle and high school. The high school students were so respectful and the staff or the work that the seventh and eighth grade uh, students were doing and it, it was just unbelievable because as you know testing is a time to a lot of stress and challenging and, and I saw an in, incredible work being done there so I'm confident you know that that school has a fighting chance I know people don't want to use that but that is the reality that they, they will have one year we are looking uh, careful of what all the support can we put in added uh, to the bilingual program, which is another challenge. You also had too many uh, staff that I non-certify, and, and uh, that's a function of shortage because we don't hire and certify people uh, because we want to. It's just that you cannot find the certified one. Actually, it would be illegal for us to hire um, certified personnel when there are certified one available. Um, the question is 1.18 about the family and consumer science and I'm just bringing this up based on our leadership meeting at 28 today when um, Susan Ladd had talked about when it comes to well, when it comes to health that come seventh grade they know it all at that point mm -hmm. so getting rid of it in not having it not taught in sixth grade is very concerning. Is that was that or was that the just the family when it comes to no, health no, education? Too. I thought looking at this, it was going to be just seventh and eighth, and sixth grade was going to focus on increased time and extended reading, et cetera, et cetera. Or did I just read it wrong? What what question are you? One point one eight. Uh, it's on page um, five, five uh, of the on, book. Um, um, round two. That there are two around two. Okay. Two. Oh, okay. So we are moving family and consumer sciences from sixth grade to seventh grade. We were hoping to use the extra period in sixth grade for literacy mm -hmm. and AIS to support students who most of the time when you look at our assessment test are below grade level. Right. So that's what we're using them for. Our technology will, go, will still be at seventh and eighth. Mm -hmm. And we're working this school year to work with the uh, family and consumer science to integrate those areas into our health and ELA courses next school year. So that's that, what it was. Yeah, yep. that's Got what it was. Looking. Got it. I recall it when we were talking. Yeah, I'm a little hazy. Thank you. <clears throat> Just uh, wanted to mention a lot of the uh, detail that um, uh, I've been looking for in terms of special ed. Some of the AP courses have been phenomenal, so appreciate it. It, it helps uh, going back to some of the, the various parent groups and explaining uh, what the district plans do. So it's it's uh, a lot of what's come through has, has been has been great. Um, there are still a few follow-up things. You can get quite all the information that we're looking for in a couple areas. Uh, I want to touch on, on two of those. Um, one is with respect to um, AP classes and what's offered online or what will be offered online versus uh, what is versus uh, what's offered in the classroom. Um, we have the, uh, the breakdown of the scores for everything that looks like classroom scores. Um, one of the requests was also to get information on the online courses and understand what number of students are taking online AP courses now, uh, how they're doing in those courses uh, relative to the classroom courses. So I believe what was provided in, um, let's see, it was round 2.1, and it looks like it was a score, and so it was 2.138. Uh, that appears to be scoring that was, it was difficult to tell whether that was uh, online or whether it was classroom or whether it was a mix of both. And one of the initiatives that will be taking place uh, this upcoming year is that students will be taking more AP classes online rather than classrooms. 
and one of the questions that, that has come up is how many more classes will be offered online and what's the history of, of students that have taken online AP courses? Is there a drop in the uh, scoring of kids that take those online courses? So that's one of the, the pieces of data that, that the parents uh, were looking for to understand that, that aspect. Yeah, we can do a comparison of the scores um, because we did. I did ask that same question, yeah. and so I can provide that that data to you. Um, if you submit it as a question, okay. I'll be sure to. Do get you want me to it. resubmit it then for the third yeah, round? Yeah, about the scores. So just so I, I'll provide it to everybody. But um, I, I have to say, as I was comparing it, the the number of students that tested with the virtual were doing very well. Um, so you know that we we've had the we have the scores all delineated. Um, and it's, it's interesting because I, more students actually challenged the exam um, when they took the virtual than they challenged the exam. So uh, we can provide that as well. And it's, I think next year we're going to see an increase in enrollment for the, the virtual courses. So that's something that we'll track carefully for you. Okay. Um, and then the other question has to do more with the uh, matching staffing to enrollment, part of the, the significant efficiency that, that the uh, that we'll gain this year. Um, in, let's see, two, I think it's 2. Well, yeah, the appendix 2.36 uh, has a listing of each school. Basically, the uh, FTE changes from uh, 14, the, from this school year to the upcoming school year. Is this the, the best compilation that's currently available to really understand where those efficiencies will come from as uh, the, the staffing in the schools is matched up to the, uh, the enrollment. Is this the best uh, document we've got to try to really understand where that impact will hit in the individual schools and at the individual positions? Uh, Barbara, would you like to answer? Sure. You know, you're well, welcome. Well, This document in combination um, with the enrollment projections is probably your best place to take a look at where the impact is, um, if I understand your question yeah. correctly. Um, within the budget, there are other uh, lines. I think, Deb, if you go to like a specific school, you might be able to see some things there that would be helpful. Um, but if you have a specific question about a school, certainly put it forward to us and we can clarify that. Okay. I guess what I was hoping to see would be something that would really outline, I believe it was the uh, the 7.3 million reduction, almost as a line item to say we expected to get this, you know, th this reduction from this school, this reduction from this school in these positions, and really see in, in Excel that add up to the, the 7.3 million. Yeah, I'm not, I would is that, have to look at the question. I guess I, guys, my question is, is, is that available? Was it done to that level of detail, or was it more a general uh, uh, estimate to come up with that, that 7.3? So, yeah, so our overall, our overall um, you know, teacher uh, headcount went down by a certain number, right? And then we, we backed out our investments, you know, for online credit recovery, you know, our investments that resulted from reducing the number of our part-time or itinerants. So, so we, we, we backed out, you know, those sort of investments that we made. And then, you know, that got us to the, to the gross number. Um, so that, that's how we came to that, to that figure. It was quantified based upon uh, where we are at aggregate after you adjusted for, for those investments that we made. Okay. The, the, the way, the way, it, it probably is could be helpful to you visually though is and I think we we've developed this I can't remember if, if the board asked for it specifically or not but you know school by school we looked at you know where are those no shows right you know and and the those students that are absent more than than 80 percent of the time as well as you know attrition data right and so you know when you look at when you look at that that was the driver, though, you know, for the, the reduction in FTEs. Basically, it was an, as an attempt to try to more efficiently allocate our resources to match the actual number of children, you know, that were, that were instructed. Okay. 
Thanks. Okay. Any other last burning questions for this session? <coughs> this no? Okay. We'll go forward to the next section. Section six, right? We're going to section six next. <coughs> And then again, five. Five is for the next round. Right. So section five is for next round. So we're going to go to section six, uh, profiles and budgets. Uh, any questions there? Okay. Uh, yeah, but, oh. go, go ahead. So I would just ask, um, and, and I have to uh, admit, uh, with traveling, uh, family issues, and being unhealthy, uh, I haven't taken as close a look at the budget as I would like to. So what has been the reduction, the overall reduction in this area? Ha has there been a reduction in would uh, uh, the unions or the community come and say that we are uh, top heavy in central office? Uh, you know, what, what would be any criticisms that the, the unions or people can say about central office that um, we should be aware of? Any increases in positions, decreases in positions? Yeah, you will see a decrease. Uh, however, I've been my worst critic. I don't think that we continue to be significant top heavy and central office, and uh, we desperately need resources in our schools. Those of you who were school 28 today know that. Um, um, all of, just to be precise, it's about, um, for central office, it's 52 position. And central office doesn't mean just this building, as you know. We have all the operation that, where those 52 people are represented, but that's, when you benchmark our central office against uh, central office throughout the country, we, I'm willing to say that we're probably in the top five, um, even at the cut in the 52 position. And again, I say this with great respect and appreciation for the people who work in central office. No offense to anyone here. It's just the, when you go to our buildings and you see the thing that they were asking for us today, you can't help but to ask the question, where are you going to get the service and support that they need? And in addition to that, the Board of Education alone, and I take responsibility for this again, when you have a K-8 aggressive plan, it costs you more, it costs you about 30% more to run a K-8 program. So if we are going to catch up with the kind of programs, like for example, every middle school when I talk with my colleagues around the county and the country, at least in New York State, traditionally you find opportunity for students to earn at least three credits. Most of our school and our KA program don't have that. So if you were to strengthening the school building and to provide the services and program that our students deserve, we will need to continue to address uh, the uh, central office. Again, that's not against the work, uh, great work that's done here in central office, but the, the number and reality, uh, we have to be brutally honest and put it on the table. The reality is that for this district to provide the services that our students urgently need, we're going to have to move even faster when it comes to central office. Um, sort of following in that same uh, line of, of interest, um, and, and Dr. Vargas, you and your team could just answer this separately, but I did notice that, for example, the chief of staff who has a huge area uh, of responsibility, um, that there may be explanations behind these positions, but if you look at page six, page 16 of section six, it lists a series of positions, and, and there may very well be uh, an explanation for all these different positions, but a special assistant to the superintendent, this is under the chief, as I read it, is under the chief of staff's office, uh, the director of management efficiency, uh, and then there's another position, educational data strategist, 
Executive Assistant, Volunteer Coordinator, Chief of, Chief of Director, Compliance of State and Federal something. You know, the, the salaries for these people, uh, you know, are in the, many of them are in, oh, well in excess of $100,000. <coughs> Some are 85. So uh, I, I, I get that there may in fact be a need for each and every one of these positions, but to the layperson reading this budget, you, you begin to wonder uh, what are all these different people doing? And, and again, separately, you could provide a separate explanation to these different folks' position. But I, I, I do wonder, uh, do we need all these people? And again, you don't have to answer now. And if we do, and I appreciate that some of these folks may be uh, hired as a result of uh, grants. Uh, and so some explanation is of that. Mr. Chairman, can I continue on with some additional questions that I have? Want to Can I just to offer a clarification? Sure. The, um, if you look on six page six point sixteen, those number of those positions you were referring to in fourteen fifteen budget, and the number of those are not in the fifteen sixteen budget. So you you see you see uh, you see uh, you know a reduction there. So. All right. So special assistance. Yeah. Right. So the special assistance eliminated, for example. I feel like I'm at Microsoft, the 2.1 version. I'm yeah. dealing with 2.1. Is that right? Is that no, right? it's in the budget book. Page in the budget book itself, 6.16. Okay. Right, Deb? Remember, you have this. Here you go. Right there, 7 to 3.5. Okay, what? Slow down, slow down. So I got a lot of people talking. Deb had it. Just, just give me the page. There you go. You got it. What page is that? 16. Yeah. 16. 16. Okay. Yeah, um, um, President, uh, Commissioner Cruz, just while well, the uh, President Wise is looking, one thing that President Ev um, former President Evans told me that I always needed an assistant, and I haven't had an assistant since I've been here. Not that I'm looking for credit, but I, no one in recent history had the record that I have in reducing uh, position from my own SEG list. Um, just the records speak very clearly. Actually, I remember uh, when Commissioner Evans was president and saying to me, Mr. Superintendent, although he called me Bohem, which I prefer that, he said, you need an assistant. And I said to him, you know, given that our school don't have arts or music or sport or extracurricular activity, I, I can't see myself doing that. So I just want for the record for that to be clear. Uh, that uh, no one in recent history have established the record that I have established when it comes to SEG list, including not having an assistant. And I don't know a superintendent in the nation at my level that does m his or her job without an assistant. So, and, I, and I appreciate that, and I, as I indicated, this was a, a written answer you could have given me later on. The, the question I have, are any of these, are these positions totally written out of the budget? Do they appear anyplace else? Or, uh, like, for example, the director of, um, yeah. senior director of management efficiencies or the educational data strategist, do they appear anyplace else in the budget, or are they yeah. gone all so, together? So those particular ones do. They were part of a, a, a reduction that was part of the administration budget. So overall, overall that number of reduction that the superintendent spoke about in the beginning, yeah. that's where it came overall. We did, we did have, and an, an, uh, Deputy Superintendent Brevard can explain, you know, how, how she was deliberate in, in taking a look at data and how we collect data and, and can consolidate, you know, key skill sets and become increasingly efficient. So, so these were transferred somewhere else, but overall headcount reduction in, in her area. Hold on one second. I, I just clarification. I, I don't understand the answer to the question. So, this so those two positions that um, President White just mentioned, are, are they still in the budget with those salaries? Yes, yes or no? Yes. Yes, in in the in the deputy in the administration. So how budget. are we reducing central office if those two positions are still in the thing? Just being moved somewhere else. No, the the net reduction oh, no. is a net reduction of overall. Okay, so within the budget you have. You have some reorganizations that created some efficiencies, okay? And that was one of the questions. I can't remember okay. uh, what number it was, but that was a question about, you know, what's anticipated around the data reorganization, and that was one of the efforts that was made to drive efficiencies. Right. Weren't, weren't two of those positions now that are being moved over there, weren't they grant-funded positions at one point? The, this they position were. of uh, yeah. senior director of management efficiencies, whatever that person does, 
and um, uh, educational data strategists. W weren't those grant funded positions originally? Those two are. Mm -hmm. They were. So now, did the, did the grants go away? They, the grant, grant concludes at the end of October. Mm -hmm. So we're paying for them. Yes. After October. Right. So what we did was we reduced other positions within the data systems. So there is an overall savings to the administrative budget. Um, we, we are creating the accountability, the Office of Accountability, because one of the things that we noticed with our data was there was so, it was coming from so many different places and people were asking so many different people for the same data. It appeared that we would get it wrong because they would ask one person and get an answer. They'd ask a, dif a different person who had a different lens on it, which would give them an answer and the, and the two answers wouldn't match. So we really had to do a lot of work to look at our data systems and bring it under a data governance management system, where, which is where those two positions belong. So, so we did shift, we did cut, overall we've reduced, um, but those two positions remain and they are in the, the research and development and data office of accountability now in the restructure. So just an add-on to Commissioner White's, uh, uh, President White's question, so what about the volunteer coordinator position? That's, that's also a very important position, that's also a grant where, that we uh, had last year with tons of fanfare that we're, that we're going to have a volunteer coordinator. So and now that grant's run out. So where is that, where is that position? Is that gone, or is that still in the budget somewhere? That, it'll it'll still continue. The the continue the grant the grant is the grant is funded until remember when Adele was at the end October. of October as well. The end of October. October after October. And then so. we're, we're committed to maintaining it after the end of October, with general funds if necessary. But you know we also have an opportunity to look for other grant funds to try to uh, right. to try to fund that in between now and then. But there's a commitment to continue that going forward. So, so, so just so that we're, we're clear, these positions that were taken out of the budget were literally taken off this page and put on another page. So, so in the conversation so far, the positions that I mentioned, the Senior Director of Management Efficiencies, I was originally told, oh, that's, that's, that's gone. Well, it is still around, but just on another page. Correct. I, and I just <coughs> arbitrarily picked these names, the Educational Data Strategists, I was told that was gone. Actually, that's just on another page. Commissioner Evans says, well, what about the other position, I volunteer coordinator? That, uh, I was told, that was original, that's gone, but that's actually on another page. Um, let's just finish this. How about the special assistant to the superintendent? Is that truly gone? Yes. I haven't had one in since I've been okay. here right. because of the I, budget I challenge you had. I, yeah, no, I appreciate that. I wasn't sure because it was under the chief of staff and whether they, it was. If I mind, I think that's it. Sometime in order, if you want to pursue all the grant, if you fund it, then you can go and look for a grant for something you already funded. No, I, and I'm just, I'm just trying to get clarity, just to make sure. And then there was one other position that I, let's see, there was half of a secretary. So there's three, the executive assistant, is that one still around? Well, that is still around because that's listed at 0.10, right? Mm -hmm. So really, only one position was taken out. Is that right? It's a little worse than that, Dan. Yeah, how so? Because but we're going to take the educational data strategist, which is a grant funded and would go away, and they'd have to leave if there's no funding, if we do nothing. But by putting, moving the position and the title, that person can go into our, our data research, our, our research department, and displace somebody. Namely, somebody who we fought to put back in the budget last year, yeah. who, and not not because they're incompetent, but be, but to make sure that somebody who doesn't have a right to a job because it was grant funded has a job. And then, and then I would ask. I can you speak. Uh, can I just speak to that? I, I, there wasn't a displacement, Will I, uh, Commissioner Powell. I think we just reorganized and we put them there because that's where they fit. That's the work that they do. So I don't want you to think that we bump somebody, we, but we, you we put a them position. into the, but you have. right. You eliminated a position. And, it, and it's somebody we, that we, we did not eliminate data positions. We made reductions in other places in school, in, in that whole school operations. So we really looked for, at the work. And the way we, we do it is what work has to be done and what positions do we need to do the work. And that's how we came to that structure. Uh, so it's about the work for the district. Yeah. Chairman Cruz, uh, this will be my last question. The rest oh, no. of them, it's all sort of on this, the same issue. Uh, the, the, the explanation, quite frankly, that we were given a few minutes ago isn't altogether accurate. 
and, and, and I'm concerned that the justification behind it perhaps wasn't accurate either. We're told that this was done so that we could spend less money at central office and more in the classroom. When in fact, we're still spending money at central office. These positions, three of the four, were not truly eliminated. We're still spending money at central office. But your explanation is, what we're doing now is we're eliminating some other positions at central office. Is that right? So all of us were charged as department heads to look through our budgets and to make reductions, which we did. And so there, there is the figure that we quoted for the overall reductions is true. There are no, I mean, it, it is for when you look at the whole administrative budget, that reduction stands. These positions are included in the budget figure, so there's no there's no shell game here. So I just want to put you at ease on that. Yeah, and on, on slide 26 yeah. of the superintendent's presentation, right. and the uh, when when we when he presented the uh, the draft budget back in March on March uh, 23rd, slide 26, you know, talks about an 8.4 million dollar uh, reduction in central office of school administration, administration, and that's where we delineate out. So on a net basis, we're down 52. On one given page, you could have some, you know, some shifting, but overall, you know, we're down, we're down by 52 for five million dollars, and then we delineate, you know, the, uh, you know, the other reductions, you know, on that slide as well. So it was page 26. Thank you, Chairman Cruz. Thank you. I have, uh, coming down the road, down the, down the line? Yes, I have a question. Uh, the secretary one, are we paying a half-time person $65,000 for part-time? No. How much is that salary? That's the average salary of a full-time. Well, all right, but this is this position for 2015-16 is being reduced to half-time. Yeah, our convention is just to show, you know, what the average salary is for that position. And then we show how many, you know, the number of FTEs in this particular uh, budget. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, people would have an issue with that if it's an average salary for a part-time person would be, for a secretary one would be sixty-five thousand dollars. Yeah, no, they have the average. The average is for a full-time position. Okay. And then you know how you get the math. You multiply the FTEs by the by the number, the average. Yeah, um, my um, l last question, uh, and, and it, it kind of go goes. To, it, might, it may have been under the. We're on section um, six. 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 But, but the section that we were on before was, was that five. When we were talking about the school profile. Four. 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 Well, just to follow up on uh, section four, and it can be answered later. Um, I think maybe uh, Commissioner Powell and Adams were trying to get to this point, but. They, they didn't ask it outright. I like to ask questions outright. Are we getting rid of, um, are we cutting, and I'm very interested in this as a liaison to the parent program, and I'm always going around bragging about the pre-K program. Are we cutting those parents, th those parent workers that are involved in the pre-K program, that get parents involved, that get parents to come, no. come to the um, programs, that, that, that work with parents about how they should read right. to their kids? Are we cutting those, cutting those folks out of um, the budget? So those were the ones we added last year. We increased the number of those folks so those last year. Those people are not being cut from the budget. So where is the money coming not, from for reading not, teachers? The, not to my knowledge. Okay. Yeah, uh, um, you're talking about the, you're talking about the, the, the preschool, so, so the preschool, the preschool called, parent. The, uh, yeah, I can't remember their title. The, the PPP. Yeah, they're the. PPP, yeah. They're, 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 some of them have been have been preschool parents prior, and their job is, you know, they, they organize the meetings. Sometimes I go to these meetings and they have the parent yeah. leaders. Yeah, the so only basically it's the parent leaders of in, in preschool because there's a rumor going around that they're being cut from the budget. So I need clarification from there to make sure that that is not the case. Yeah, we'll, we'll, um, let's, in fact, we'll put that on the grid. We'll make sure we we delineate the numbers so you can see we have X number this year, Y number next is, year. So the answer is no. The only thing I will tell you, if, if we will cut in that program, you will see about 100 people here, and uh, it's one of those things when we add it. No one came and said to you, what a great job. We added that program last year, and we had some credibility in this regard. Well, but, but and, and I just, let me finish. I'm just saying that it's important for us as a board and as a district to talk about what we have and not to constantly, constantly. When I go to this community, they still believe that you don't have certain things. Right. I still talk, trying to convince them that the IB program at Wilson is coming back. 
and that we're investing in Edison. And they're still back in the old thinking that we budget season in Rochester is about cutting and cutting and cutting. And I think that we've been very transparent in here. I was asked that question. Actually, it was even more disrespectful than that. They said, do you really understand your budget? Do you really uh, know that it's going to cost you more money if you do this change or that? And I, I said to them, no, the reality is that we are committed about preschool program here. Yeah. I was just going to say, Mr. Superintendent, that's why we need to make sure that we, yeah. that's why I advocated for last time, increasing the communications. We've got, we got to keep getting it out there. Right. The other thing I'll say to you is when, you, when you're on the school board or at the city school district, when you're right, you're wrong. <laughs> And when you're wrong, you're wrong. Right. <laughs> just, just to be, I want to be for. I, I, I like that. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> I, I want to be for coming. So the only, the only reduction I'm aware of for the pre-K is where we had a, it was for the three-year-old program. Right. Well, yeah, I know about so that. we I'm, know I'm about hoping, that. And I'm hoping that we can find a yeah. grant somewhere. And then, somewhere. and then I, and then we added it last year because, I mean, actually, Commissioner Adams, you know, advocated early on when I came, and and then we we took a look at. You know, is there an opportunity to, you know, use our grant funds for that purpose? Right. There was, and so we, we added that. That directly reflected, you know, the board's, the board's input. And I hope that we can find some more money for three years. Well, thank you, but I just wanted to get that clarification so that makes me feel better. And the information is on Section 4, page 180. Section 4, page 180. Yep, thank you. Thank you. And the grant page 180. I want a job as a secretary. Any questions? If I hire you, it would be a conflict of interest. <laughs> Commissioner Evans, are you all set? I, I'm all set. Good. We go down by two. President Weiss, any questions? I'm, I'm good. Thank Sir? you. I'm good. <laughs> Thank you. Commissioner Elliott? I want me a secretary a job. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll hook you up. Commissioner Adams? Um, I'm sorry yeah, if I can't sorry. find the answer, um, and I didn't study this soon enough, but I asked a question about the mail room and the three positions and how, what the rationale for a small department like that being privatized is and what the, did you answer it? Was it, does that, do you remember uh, I, that? I think it was. I do. Um, and actually there was, I'm sorry. There was also a, another question that came in after that asking for a cost benefit analysis. But those were just submitted, um, so I don't. Oh, so that wasn't in the round that we were already working on. That wasn't in section six. Um, I think that was submitted in section oh, I'm six. Sorry. But anyway, can you comment on that, or do you want to just, or should we just resubmit it to be answered? No, yeah, and the, and the list that I saw, and you know, that it was due for the, you know, the upcoming date, not for this date. But I'll be glad to answer. The, oh, um, that's actually that's fine then. Is I that won't okay? Hold up the time if you're gonna okay. Answer, no, yeah. we we have it and. Okay, we'll get a, okay. We'll get an answer. Yep. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, um, my <coughs> question is back on section four. The um, the uh, school profile for Rochester Early College is also missing. And it's still missing because it wasn't identified earlier. Um, <laughs> the secondary schools are missing. So we need a more complete list than just Northeast, Northwest, and all city uh, for the high schools. Um, the, um, is, is the Young Mothers Program, as I see, is listed in the program section, and all city high is listed in section four for schools, but functionally they're the same. They don't award the graduation diplomas under their own name. The kids that graduate effectively graduate from their home school. So I'm a little perplexed why one is in one place and the other is in another place, and they're not treated the same. And I don't care where they're treated so long as they're treated the same. Um, and I mean, the level of my concern is is almost too difficult to articulate. I look at Rochester Early College high school budget. I see almost, uh, almost 
uh, I see a, fi a five FTE increase, no increase in the budget. Can't figure out how that happens. But the student enrollment's the same. But we're increasing the staffing by five. And then a school like School 15, which year after year after year we have to argue in favor of holding their model intact, is once again being reduced by about 10% uh, of their staff with exactly the same projected enrollment. And the, and the drop is in Paris, which, I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not uh, particularly an advocate of paraprofessionals or not uh, over any other group, but the fact is that School 15's entire model depends upon the paras and their the school psychologists, the, the positions that are being cut. And year after year, we have to argue to hold their School 15's program intact. I just call that out to my colleagues because I don't know that there is an answer. But I have a hard time believing that the principal of that school actually accepted this answer without a fair amount of kicking and screaming because this is not faithful to their, to their program design. And either we're going to do a school 15 and be faithful to the design or we're going to stop doing it. And if we're going to stop doing it, let's stop pretending we're doing it. That's all. So you just direct the comments? Okay. Uh, which are the comments? Um, I was, I'm going to ask, I asked questions and they were late, so I apologize on OASIS. So I'll wait to hear responses and then the next board deliberation session. So I don't want to waste time on that one. I know you guys are working on, question, on responses. Um, and I think some of the answers to my other questions I saw in 2.1. So one quick follow-up. Where is the newcomer program in the budget? Maria. Uh, Rochester Early College, International College. Okay. It's actually on page... 153. Thank you. Sorry, I'm bringing this back to four. <coughs> 153? Yes, starts from 153 and goes up to 155, section four. So Rochester International Academy. Oh, what about, I'm talking about we in the responses and we talked about a newcomer program for Spanish speakers, is that correct? So I was just curious where that was because one of the other things, you know, when you go to these school visits, you get enlightened, is they taught, you know, when Susan had talked about how they come, you get newcomers in May, and then they've got to spend their time ramping them up. So in terms of the newcomer program, Will that be for, say, like that May-June time frame to get them ramped up in the system and then be ready the next school year? How is that going to work? Yeah, that's a great question. And go back to your original question. What are we going to do different for Monroe? <coughs> you don't see that in the budget, but my discussion with, in the, the state visit and with Mrs. Ramos, she's very much interested, and I go back to what was said about those um, school in the receivership, that would be part of the first thing that we will do, um, starting a new common program for, uh, uh, for the high school kid. Now, we do have uh, at least one teacher is devoted to that school number nine, and I believe that is in the budget. Mm -hmm. okay. But we, we are firmly committed to the whole notion that we also have a student that are 20 years old. They, they come to us, and we have to sign them in, and they have one year to go. And there's no way that in one year they're going to be mm -hmm. successful when they don't have, you know, the English language skill background. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then... Um, uh, and Sarah, Commissioner, I just want to be clear that you don't see that in the budget. What you're hearing from me, that there's a commitment and a, a, a very good chance that 
that's something that we will be able to do, particularly at Monroe, with the new opportunity for, uh, for the grant that will come as a result of the receivership. There is some information in section uh, question 2.45, but that does not get to the heart of the matter that the superintendent just mentioned. Thank you very much. And um, these are more vi uh, verification. So based on the homeschool assistance, bilingual homeschool assistance are moved back under teaching and learning, I saw in the responses. Yes, they are. And then there's still, I was just looking under parent engagement, I forgot what page it was on, I was just looking. Then there's uh, a bilingual um, community engagement. Engagement liaison person there. And then, so with the lead teacher bilingual, <coughs> it is more so redefining that role based on special ed. Is that what I read? Yes, it is. Okay, <laughs> I just want to make sure I'm getting it, you know, I'm retaining it yes. <laughs> correctly. And then um, I think that was it. I, I did ask another question, trying to understand the purpose of the executive director of ELL, what that person is charged with. So I'll wait for a response. I'm, I'm good with that. So, um, and I think that was it. And I'll wait for Oasis to hear back on that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm good right now. Thank you. All right. Any other uh, questions on uh, section uh, six? No questions on section six. Uh, section seven. We've already talked to uh, Dr. Yubing. Are there any other questions there with regard to East High Section 7? Hearing none. Section 8. All four pages. No, no questions there either. I'll assume there aren't any. And then that's it, right? Uh, okay, great. Uh, so uh, next round, we're going to be going back to Section 5, um, which are the programs, and CIP too, right? Yes. So we're doing Section, section 5, the, the uh, programs, Section, uh, whatever that is, 9, CIP, and then uh, closing up with other questions for the rest of the budget. Um, I want to thank everybody. Uh, for uh, uh, hanging in there. Uh, again, thanks to staff to, for compiling all the questions. Thank you for responding. Uh, the, the responses have been great and been really helpful. And our next uh, pu our public hearing is uh, coming up. Uh, let's see, we have a public hearing Tuesday, April the 28th. Uh, we have a third budget deliberation session, April the 30th. And then we have our special meeting to adopt the budget May 7th. So, uh, Peter Brantley? Unless there are any, uh, any issues, I'd like to uh, stand adjourned. Second. Thank you, Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.